Kanita Abri, thank you very much for coming on to this Zoom call and uh, agreeing to be part of this discussion. Really, we wanted um, to, to hear your perspectives on, on two things, really. Um, so it would be good, firstly, to hear your reflections on the murder of George Floyd. Um, and uh, that incident happened over two weeks ago now, and uh, there's been a whole load of articles written, tweets tweeted, posts shared on this issue uh, from all kinds of different, different political and social um, perspectives. And it would be great just to, just to hear your own reflections on that incident and how you've been processing it and what you've been thinking about it and um, how, how your friends perhaps have been thinking about it as well. And to hear how knowing Jesus has made a difference to how you've been processing it. And then, and then after that, it would be good to hear your reflections on the Black Lives Matter movement as a whole, um, which has been around uh, for longer than this, but has, has kind of re resurfaced um, in, in the wake of the George Floyd murder. And just to hear again how, how you have been thinking about that movement as a whole, because obviously um, it is very much connected to the George Floyd case, but also there are some striking differences um, between the movement Black Lives Matter and, and the uh, issue of um, George Floyd and, and others. Um, and just to get your perspectives on those two, two things, really. And um, yeah, it'd be great just to, for you guys just to take the conversation wherever you, wherever you want it to go and um, to share what you've been, you've been thinking. So, um, Abri, why don't, why don't um, you kick us off and then um, Kanita, that, that would be great. Yeah, um, well, I think um, just watching, watching the George Floyd video, um, I think like with anyone else, is watching it, it's pretty shocking to see. And, um, you know, he, he's got three officers on him. One of them has his knee on, his, on George, George Floyd's neck. Um, which I don't know from anyone's stance, that seems clearly an excessive use of force, which is a problem, I think, just with American policing, it seems, in general. Um, so the whole situation is pretty, um, so quite shocking. And, um, you know, there, there, have, there have been these sorts of incidents in America, um, you know, over the last sort of few years, um, so certainly after the civil rights movement. And um, you know, every time every time this sort of thing happens, um, it is quite widely publicised, and you know, there are always sort of different viewpoints on on the issue. But uh, personally, I try to um, not try not to re react too quickly, and um, wait until some more evidence comes um, comes comes through, because there have been sort of let's say false negatives where um, a person has been, you know maybe shot and killed and people protest because they think it's completely unjust and then more evidence comes out and, and they find that you know, there was some other circumstance that, that wasn't taken into account when it was first reported and it changes the whole sort of reading of the situation. Um, and certainly with the, with the George Floyd case, that's the same approach I took. Um, and I think generally with sort of family members and friends, um, there's kind of a lot of, uh, it's very mixed, sort of very mixed picture. Lots of mixed emotions. Um, there's people who are just really, really angry. Um, there are people who, um, I, th I think, well, I think everyone definitely is angry. Um, but um, it's it's kind of the reaction to the murder that is, let's say, taking up all of people's attention now. So in a sense, George Floyd is hasn't been quite been forgotten yet, but um, he's. He, his death has taken backstage to um, uh, to the protests that are going on at the moment. Yeah, thank you, Kanita. What 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 about you? Um. Yeah. So when I watched the video, um, it was quite hard to watch um, and very hard to um, to get through. Um. And similar to sort of Abby, um, my friends and family and myself, there was a lot of anger um around the whole situation, but behind that it was also a sense of pain and I think um is I mean it's like it's not the first time that we've heard about police brutality in America um with like racial connotations involved in it but I think why this one hit so hard was because of how soon after it came um after different cases so it, I think like about a month before it had the um, sort of Ahmad Aubrey case where he was jogging down the street 
and then was shot and killed. Um, and then there was another video that went viral where there was a lady who was in the park um, and she made a sort of um, 911 call to the police and she was saying that she was going to call the police and tell her that a black man was threatening her life. And it was all very dramatic, but um, the person filming was a black man and he was just asking her to, um, to put her dog on a leash because I think in that park they weren't allowed to have dogs not on a leash. And I think it was just more triggering because of it was just the the events leading up to it and then then this it sort of caused a catalyst of people thinking more widely around um sort of the um the racism that black people do face in america and um, and around the world and i think yeah that that was the motivation of the pain behind me where in the sense of this wasn't just oh it's happened again it was sort of why is this continuing to happen and it started sparking a lot of conversations um, within my friends and family was pretty much what we talked about for um, the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah, so it, it was it was a, um, a painful thing to watch, and there was a lot of emotion behind it. One of the things that um, was in quite a lot of the articles, certainly that I looked at, is um, is that that, pe that people were saying, yeah, the, you know, the George Floyd incident, um, you know, was was obviously to anyone who watched it was horrific, and uh, we know even in kind of recent American police history, that it's not an isolated case. But lots of people were saying, yeah, um, but this, 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 this kind of treatment happens all the time. You know, it may not be as extreme as that. That, that kind of thing might not happen to everyone, but mm. there is a kind of low-level experience of racism that, that lots of people do, do have. Is that, is, I don't, is that something that you, you both agree with and resonate with? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Average you want to go first? Yeah. Um, well, I think um, uh, it's, it's, there's kind of a, a distinction, I suppose, um, which might be useful, and it's one that people don't make um, much uh, nowadays. And, and I would say there's a distinction between prejudice and, and racism. Uh, prejudice um, sort of being um, maybe perhaps discounting a person um, not necessarily hating the person or being afraid of the person, but just discounting them or treating them in a particular way purely because of their race um, in that sense. So, so that was quite a, a word that was quite popular um, in the civil rights, rights movement. But then there's like, the actual racism, which is, you know, actually sort of, you know, w wishing ill and, you know, hating someone purely because of their race. And so I think there's, there's a lot of, prejudice um, you know whether that's conscious or unconscious um, you do you, you do get that um, and sometimes it's it's not it's not um, uh, it's not malicious you know people aren't necessarily trying to uh, harm or injure um, or hurt another person but it, it's it's kind of works itself out in, in a way that is certainly not helpful um, but as far as sort of um, racism is concerned i think generally I, I my my own experience i think that there's i've felt that there's less of it um over the years than than certainly when i first moved over to this country uh, 20 or so years ago um i've i certainly felt a lot less of it um but i think there is still you still you still get prejudice um kind of wherever you go really um which is a kind of a low-lying thing and i mean i could give several sorts of examples of how this happens but um but yeah it's certainly it's certainly still there i would say yeah um i, I think i'll sit um along the similar lines there is um a sense of sort of um, unconscious bias um that's there whether um whether um intentionally or not and like i agree i mean not everyone necessarily does it with malicious intent and I certainly don't think that that's the vast majority of people specifically in, in the UK but I do think that from my own experience that I have I created a sort of double consciousness where in the sense that I do behave in a certain way when I'm around predominantly white people as opposed to when I'm around um, people of, of my own race or of a different race to be honest with you um, and that the different reasons for that are just cultural backgrounds and similarities and things like that but there is um I do feel like there has been an underlying sort of current around black people in the sense that you you sort of you are very aware of um who you are in certain surroundings and that's the stories that i've heard coming out of the george floyd matter from 
a number of close family and friends in the sense that um, a lot of my male friends feel like they need to like you know be threatening themselves if they're on the tube or if they are walking past like you know a, um, a, a white lady or a friend said that she always makes sure she gets a receipt whenever she goes into the shop just because she's constantly used to people asking her or oh, did you pay for that and um, that that's not necessarily saying that the person who asked her that question is like you know racist or hates her or wants to like you know, kill her or anything but it is that sort of um stigma that has been set that you know a person who looks a certain way might have come, come from a certain background where you don't really know anything about that person or, or who they are um and just thinking about it from a christian perspective i i, I don't know i just felt like it's something that needed to be addressed and talked about because fundamentally it is like a sin issue and a heart issue because if you've been preconditioned through media or just in your social surroundings that you've never really interacted with people of a different race um, to think about people that is the, um, of the other in a certain way. That's fundamentally a heart issue. Like you, no, no system is necessarily going to change how people behave. Like there's an argument that's been going around that says that like, well, the men the police men weren't necessarily racist, but you know, they're just being predisposed to think that a black men in a certain neighborhood are more likely to carry a gun so they're quicker to shoot first rather than you know, take more precautions to see what and uh, assess the situation. Fair enough, but doesn't that but doesn't the result that there have been loads of people being killed who weren't in any I didn't carry um, um weren't carrying guns and weren't in any danger to the police mean that we need to reassess how it is that we're thinking about people of different races um within our own minds and the only person that can change that is is Jesus so I thought it was very important that um the church sort of lead the discussion in that sense because it is fundamentally a sin issue Thank you for that. And just just to pick up on something you said, you both uh, you both kind of said earlier. I, I think is that because I know I know Kanita, you were born in London but moved to Birmingham, you know, in your childhood. Yeah. Um, and Abra, you haven't always grown up in London, in London, have you? Um, I know you're up north for a while and stuff. Do you, do you do you think there is a difference? Um, I mean, Abra, you were saying twenty years ago, you know, you know, it would have been different to what it was today. Do you think there's also something about London which is different to? other parts of the UK in this would that be true or yeah I, I think so um so I've I've lived in Leeds and Newcastle and Edinburgh um and certainly more metropolitan uh, towns um you know a black face is not uncommon so so people are are used used to 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 different ethnicities um um, whereas up north, um, there have been times when I've um, doing my job. I've, I've been walking around in the village, uh, for instance, and people, several people walking, you know, walking up to me saying, "Are you lost? Are you lost?" <laughs> and kind of the implica implication <laughs> thing that uh, you know you certainly don't belong here. But I don't think it was malicious, you know, per se. But um, again, is that is just not being used to seeing um, uh, people from other races, um, other ethnicities. And um, I think, yeah, 20 years ago, um, uh, even even in Leeds, even Leeds is quite multicultural, even in Leeds, um, you, you would still get um, some racial abuse. I mean, one of my brothers um, coming back from work once uh, had someone just shouted slurs at him and spat in his face um, for with no apparent reason whatsoever. Um, and I certainly had, um, you know, slurs thrown at me um, uh, again, with no kind of um, agitation, uh, you know, no confrontation whatsoever. It's just, you know, they've just come out from nowhere, it seems. Um, I haven't had that in London. Um, I certainly, I, we certainly did when I visited uh, on holiday, so about, about 30 years ago. Um, it was the very first time I actually um, heard anyone, well, anyone use a racial slur. It was actually in London in, in the tube against one of my brothers, actually. Um, so that hasn't happened in London. Um, I think this, certainly it was more common uh, back, you know, 20 years ago or so, and certainly more common up north where you have fewer ethnic minorities. Yeah, yeah, I also I agree. I think because London is a lot more metropolitan and there's so many different cultures around, um, you're exposed to that. Whereas if you are you do live in a predominantly um white neighborhood or um, a culture where there's just predominantly um, white people or just predominantly black people you're i think there is you are more predisposed to not being so open to 
other people just because it's not what you know. I think when you are open to, um, when you do live in a diverse um, community, which I think is why diversity is so key, it does make you um, more um, empathetic and just more understanding of things that are outside your immediate circle and your immediate world. And yeah, I do definitely feel that. I, I, like I said, I moved to Birmingham when I was young, but I mostly schooled in Brighton, um, which was, again, predominantly, I've always schooled around predominantly white people. And that's not to say that I felt like every day I was, um, there was racism towards me, but you do notice certain, uh, I'm certain like, there's all like um, intricacies about like, comments about my hair or, or things like that, where it was just because they weren't, I was the only black person that they knew and they hadn't been exposed to anyone from that race before. Thank you. Um, and just thinking now a bit broader about the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and um, I mean, particularly on social media, you know, that, that has really taken, taken off on Twitter and Facebook and, uh, and Instagram, I guess, and, and those kind of things. How, I mean, I suppose, firstly, how much have you kind of engaged with, with the Black Lives Matter movement and been following its progress? And if you have been doing that, what, I mean, do you think it's wholly positive or wholly negative or a, or a bit of both? Um, what, what are your reflections, I suppose, on the movement as a, as a whole, which, as I say, definitely linked to George Floyd, but seems to be its own separate uh, thing as well? Kanita, do you want to start us off with that one? Yeah, sure. Um, so as a movement, I think that the movement is important because I think it's important to bring these issues to light. I don't think, I think it might be a, a lot easier to sort of ignore it and, and say like, oh, well, you know, um, we'll, we'll do things to you know, make sure this doesn't happen again. But I think that education is the key to anything that uh, there's an issue. How do you sort of address the issue and, and, and fix the issue? So I think as a movement in, in terms of making people aware of the um, prejudices and racism that, um, do face ethnic minorities around the world, it's important, not just black people, but um, everyone. But in specifically, um, um, obviously specifically, black lives are the ones that, especially in, in America where it originated, black lives are the ones that are, are mostly being, you know, um, black people are the ones being killed in the street by the, um, by the police and facing a lot of these brutalities. Um, not so, um, to a more significant degree than any other, um, other race. But obviously, as Christians, I do think that everything that um, we do and everything that we, we think does need to um, fall under the authority of scripture um, and the way that we think about how we proceed with something. The world might say something that's true, but all truth is ultimately God's, God, God's truth. And the fact that um, Black people or anyone of any race is someone who is created in the image of God and worthy of dignity is, is truth, and it's truth from the Bible. But how we go ahead, you know, sort of enforcing that truth in society does need to come from um, through the lens of scripture. Um, so in the sense of we do that through loving our neighbor and through serving one another and not through sort of um, any extreme measures. But I do think that as a movement it is something that does need to be discussed about. So it does have a mixture of goodness and, um, goodness and, and, and bad, but I don't think that as Christians we're not supposed to fall in any other, any extreme unless it's you know, biblical. Thank you for that. Yeah, Abri, would you add anything to that? Yeah, um, in terms of just Black Lives Matter, um, again, this is kind of a distinction to be made because there, there is an actual group um, that has chapters and that people can sign up to an actual organization, Black Lives Matter, which um, looking at their mission statements and, and the things that they say that they're about um, is absolutely horrendous. And I think that um, any Christian reading that state, their, their statements um, would be, you know, pretty much mortified by the sorts of things that they say they stand for. Um, but there's there's separate to the actual organisation. There's the movement and the the slogan, which um, which we we're hearing a lot about, which um, I think expresses a lot of sort of the anger um, and the frustration uh, that we've just been talking about. Um, you know, th there's there's definitely. Uh, um, Kind of a callousness um, towards um, black people that needs to be addressed, um, and I think that's largely what lots of the anger is about. 
Um, but th this this kind of all reminds me of um, the American civil rights movement. Not that I was alive to to see it at the time, but um, it reminds me of um, the fact that you had uh, you had two leaders effectively, um, Malcolm X and um, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Taking very different different approaches. Um, Malcolm X um, was not opposed to and sometimes encouraged violence, um, whereas Martin Luther King. Uh, Junior focused on the Bible and, and this message of reconciliation, where he 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 he, he gave people a dream. You know that famous speech he talks about how uh, one day we would we, we could perhaps all be united, and um, that seems to me a message straight out of the Bible, where um, you know Paul says you know uh, that there's no longer a Jew or Gentile, male, male or female, um, slave or slave or free, and we're all united in Christ. And, and it's that message of reconciliation that I think is missing in the movement at the moment. And, and it's, it seems to me just, just anger, which to me can't, can't go very well. You know, it's either going to, if, if, it's, if it's a manufactured sort of anger that's just been amplified by Facebook and social media, then it maybe it's just fizzle out. If it's, if it's a real kind of anger, then I think this, I don't think there's going to be much good that comes out of it. I think, um, I think all, all sides of the argument will probably um, suffer for it. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm just wanting to to latch onto a voice that can that can give a message of reconciliation in the public. But at the moment, there isn't really any sort of real leadership, and it's it just seems like a bit of um, um, a lot of noise at the moment. Um, and yeah, no no clear direction. And I think that's that's what's really needed for, for to actually sort of for especially for Christians to be able to really kind of back it. And uh, you need that clear direction. But as as Christians, you know, we are uh, agents uh, of God. We're His ambassadors on this on this on this earth. So we should be uh, doing our whatever we can to to bring that reconciliation. You know, there are you know maybe this highlights to some people things that they might be able to change it in their lives so you know just go ahead and change that you know we're not all going to be martin luther king jr but you know maybe there are things that we can all sort of do and um, maybe change our the way that we think about things and perhaps question things a little bit but um but yeah i am looking for that voice of reconciliation in, in all of this to latch on to I think that's really helpful. And just to pick up on something you, you said there, I remember, I know it's a completely different issue, but with the Me Too, with the Me Too movement that also took off similarly on, um, on social media, um, I, I read an article on it, which was really helpful. And it, and it was talking about all the kind of um, celebrities that, that were being, you know, exposed for, um, you know, sexual sins that they committed or abuse that they committed. And uh, the article was not in any way wanting to justify any of that. And, and in fact, was encouraging all of that to be exposed. But the point he was making was that in Hollywood, there's no altar. And the point there was that there is no place of forgiveness and reconciliation. There is no space for that. It is purely a place of exposure and condemnation and anger. And, um, you know, I wonder if that's part, partly what you're, what you're saying as well, that um, there's, there's a kind of right anger that needs to be expressed, but without any obvious way to do it, because the world, the world doesn't really have that answer that, that, the, gospel, that the gospel provides us with. Um, and I think it's why conversations like this are, are so helpful, because the other problem with social media is it doesn't allow for nuanced, balanced debate about things. Um, it demands, you know, the currency is sound bites, isn't it? You know, it, and it yeah. demands that you um, repeat and retweet um, the the catchy, provocative, edgy slogans, and refuses to allow sort of scope and history and balance and different opinions, which which in the end is going to be futile because you can you can never come to helpful conclusions if that's how you want to want to debate so i think there are lots of good about social media but that's one of the you know that's certainly one of the things that are, is not is not good um so just just last last few minutes then and and you know wonderfully you've both sort of brought this out already um but as, as followers of G how does being a follower of jesus and knowing the gospel and knowing the truth about humanity and the truth about christ how Perhaps just in a in a couple of sentences, maybe or a bit more than that. How how does that provide a lens 
through which you you view everything. Um, as I say, you've already touched on that a bit, but perhaps we could um, hear hear maybe a bit more from Matt Abri. Do you do you want to start us off there? Yeah. Um, well, you know, just uh, reiterating um, what Paul said that that you know Jesus has brought down those um, dividing lines, and um, you read in, like, say, for instance, the Book of Revelations, and and, and how. Um, you know, the bride of Christ comes from every corner of the earth, and um, ultimately, none of these divisions are, are going to matter, and we will all be able to um, focus on God rather than on each other, rather than on our differences. And we see some of that already in the church. Um, we see churches where, you know, the people from so, so many different nationalities all come together. Um, I, I, I'm always um, astounded by just the fact that I could fly halfway around the world and meet some person in some remote tribe somewhere, and and you know, if that person is a Christian, I can genuinely call that person my brother or my sister, and that to me is the I guess the the vision of of uh, that, that paints to me is far more impressive in my mind, far bigger in my mind than than um, sort of the smallness of the sort of racial um, divisions that we've, we seem to kind of made more um, ingrained in our culture. So, um, so yeah, I, I just think that the hope in Christ is, is, yeah, that's where we should be focusing on. Thank you. Anita? Um, yeah, I think for me, it's that um, Jesus is, is the answer in, in every single thing. Um, I mean, he's the answer to me when and he, I know he's a savior who weeps with me and feels um, my pain. And he's, um, he's one who, who gets angry and, at injustice um, and sin and ultimately will judge it when he, com when he comes again. And also he, he's one who calls his followers to, um, to live like him with compassion and to move and act when they do see um, injustice in the world. And he's just ultimately the answer. And as the body of Christ, like I've already said, he's one that has united us all from all races um, in himself um, and then has asked us to go out and be light and salt to the world so that the world can see how his initial intention for all nations was to, to live in peace with one another and um, to be brothers and sisters um, um, and to love one another and I think that when we look at Jesus and continue to follow his examples in, in all those ways then the world will follow suit that we can't expect the world to do live in a in, in an idealist world when only jesus is the one know, who knows how to bring that that world to perfection so i think just keep looking at keep to, um looking at jesus for me has been really helpful oh man thank you yeah I, I read one one chat again it was a nice tweet soundbite you know but it was um often we want we want unredeemed people to behave like redeemed people without a redeemer and he was just expressing how futile that is. And, and actually, we need, we need Christ in order to cure the prejudices and sins of our heart um, and free us to, lo to love people and to keep preaching the gospel. So um, th thank you so much both for coming on and discussing openly and so thoughtfully. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Thanks.